Great. Hey, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about privacy, um, how I use OpenStreetMap to evaluate privacy, and uh, the majority of the talk will be dedicated to breaking privacy. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I'm going to move through a lot of information here, uh, a lot of maps. And uh, at the end, I'm going to hope for enough time for some questions. Um, so keep those till the end. And uh, yeah, I look forward to having a chat with you all. <clears throat> Um, just to introduce myself up front, uh, my name is Morgan Herlocker. Um, many of you might know me from my open source work, like the TurfJS project um, and other kind of geospatial analysis libraries and graph routing libraries that are used in the OpenStreetMap community. Um, I have been with OSM for quite a while. Uh, I worked at Mapbox for a long time on their telemetry pipelines, uh, basically wrangling large amounts of location data like this and turning it into different types of map data that went back into OpenStreetMap and other, other sources. Um, today, I actually work uh, at Shared Streets, a uh, newish nonprofit where we connect open data sets um, around the internet. We're building linear reference systems, basically protocols to share this uh, type of open street data um, between cities, commercial providers, hackers like, like hobbyists in the OSM community, et cetera. Um, in my spare time, though, uh, I think a lot about privacy and I think a lot about how um, the data that we're putting out into the world can be used for unintended purposes. Um, first off, I kind of want to talk a little bit about what open data is. And um, open data is obviously something that we all believe is a public good. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Um, Open data uh, makes the world more efficient. It makes the world more transparent. It lets us all understand the world around us in a, in a more complete way. Um, so it's really important to have as much open data as possible. My view is basically like, if you can do it safely, like it should probably be open. Um, but there are other public goods. Uh, privacy is one of those and civil liberties are, are another. Um, these, these two values are constantly in tension. And as we think about open data, uh, many of us need to think about how we balance those two and make sure that uh, we don't tip the scales in one direction too far or the other. Um, there's always, always risk associated with open, opening data, uh, but there's also uh, risks associated with not opening data as well. Um, so it's, it's important to find that balance. Um, in particular, governments uh, have a unique role in their responsibility for balancing safety and transparency. Um, governments have the authority to regulate commercial providers. They can actually, by force of law, tell you, hey, you have to give me this data, and I now will open it um, because I say so. <laughs> um, there, people in these positions have, have a unique responsibility and I think in general um, a, a really unique attitude of, of empathy for the communities that they live in. They're on the ground next to people and they uh, take that role of, of safety, public safety, very seriously. Um, when we think about this, the privacy issue though, um, it's really an issue of vulnerability. Privacy especially affects people that are vulnerable. Um, so this could be people who are in a, in a lower social class, a lower economic class. It's people um, of color, people of uh, any kind of discriminated class, people with disabilities, people, um, anyone who is targeted for discriminatory purposes or purposes where um, even things that we might not think of, like people who have secrets of some sort. You know, um, if you have, uh, a friendship with someone that you wouldn't want your family to know about, or if you uh, have joint activities in your life, like say you go to a certain type of church and you also go to a certain type of uh, LGBT bar. Um, these kind of things are, are intersectional and it's really important to think about how these things collide um, in, in really kind of chaotic ways in the real world. Um, and just last thing on that intersectionality, I'll note that uh, 
many of us here are, are pretty privileged, but I think that all of us have cases where that intersectionality overlaps with our particular lifestyle and our particular circumstances. Um, so if, if you don't think that now, uh, maybe by the end, you might think of a few things that, that you might like to keep private about where you go in the world. Um, before we get too much further, though, we should talk about what I mean by location data. Uh, it's kind of a vague, like, markety term. Um, location data is essentially three things at its core. It's longitude, it's latitude, and it's a timestamp. So it's a place in time, um, and it's a location. Uh, so if I had a GPS unit, perhaps on my phone, and I open up a app like Foursquare, um, my GPS is pinging satellites running around in the sky, and it's actually sending that data off um, to the internet. Uh, and beyond that, it's really up to the people who have providence over that data to determine what happens with it. Um, GPS is probably the most familiar type of location data, uh, but the reason why we don't use that term particularly, especially today, is that there are many, many more types, um, even on your phone, where this data comes from. So everybody kind of knows about GPS, satellites circling the sky, but there's other types of, of chips even on your phone. So one example is uh, cell towers. As you walk about the planet, uh, your phone is constantly connecting and disconnecting from cell towers that are in the vicinity. There's usually coverage of multiple towers at any given time. And if you kind of average or triangulate the, the space in between these towers, what you end up with is a fairly okay, accurate, ish uh, estimate of precision. And obviously there's a clock, so we've got longitude, latitude, and timestamp. That's location data. Um, we also have Wi-Fi triangulation nowadays. Um, if you're in a city, uh, there's usually very poor um, connectivity to GPS satellites with tall buildings. It bounces around the glass, that kind of thing. Um, in certain parts of the world, you're dealing with uh, ionospheric weather, space weather, that can interfere with GPS signal. And um, what most cell phones and other types of devices do today is they actually build an ensemble model of all of these sources and they use kind of the best of breeds. They'll actually uh, mix them together to get a, a much more accurate picture. Um, we also have old school methods that are, that are used in modern context as well. Dead reckoning is probably one of the oldest positioning systems around. Um, it was invented by boat captains, I believe, like with a sextant and you can only bring out the sextant and align with the stars so often. So you would measure your speed and measure the time since the last measurement. Dead reckoning lets you estimate your position in the future at a higher frequency than you'd be able to manually do so with those devices. There's also a bunch of other records that we don't think about. Um, so I've got a credit card here in my pocket. A lot of us do. Um, there's no chip in here. There's well, there might be a chip in this one actually, but there's not a there's not a GPS chip. Um, really, just a magnetic card. This data is uh, when you swipe at a uh, point of service terminal, when you go to a restaurant or uh, or a bank. Um, that is essentially a pre-geocoded record. It has longitude, latitude, and of course, transactions have timestamps. So if you were to collect this data in bulk, you'd end up with a pretty good picture of where you went through the world. Um, it's not only about uh, where the data is sourced from, though. It's also about how it spreads. Um, data is increasingly, location data is increasingly ubiquitous through the world. It is literally everywhere. Um, so we've got just a, a kind of sampling here. Uh, we've got GBFS for bikes. This is a bike share specification. If you took a nice bike this weekend in Minneapolis, that would have been broadcasting your location data as you traveled through the world. If you were using the docked mode, then it would probably be uh, pretty simple. You know, you were at the dock, uh, not too revealing, but if you were docking somewhere, or if you were using it in dockless mode, you can just drop those things off anywhere then that could be uh, potentially revealing information about, about uh, your movements that's unique to you. Uh, kind of moving through the other ones, we've also got MDS, this is a new standard for scooters. Um, we've got GTFS for trains. We've got uh, APIs, uh, a lot of these are proprietary, like Nextbus for uh, buses and other types of light, light rail. We've got uh, 
ADS-B, this is Aeronautical Data Surveillance Dash B. I don't know what the B stands for, if anything. <laughs> I assume there was a dash A at some point. Um, but this is for planes. All planes are broadcasting their GPS coordinates along with altitude and time as they travel through the sky. You can use this to re-ID uh, the president. <laughs> um, and people have done that. There's a hacker named John Wiseman down in LA who actually found um, Air Force One. And then a few minutes later actually found Air Force Two and, and uh this was back in like 2014, so it was uh, Barack and Michelle. <laughs> uh, perfect re-ID there, because there's only one person who rides that plane <laughs> um, at a particular time. <laughs> um, so we also have AIS for boats. Uh, we've got RTK for autonomous vehicles. I'm running out of fingers here. We've got EXIF. This is actually a, a tagging scheme that embeds into all photographs. Um, so you can actually tag... Uh, you can read through the Flickr feed. A uh, researcher named Eric Fisher has actually done this with a project called the Geotaggers Atlas, where he scrapes the Flickr feed live and pulls out these incredible uh, path maps that were probably almost entirely unintentionally created uh, by users who didn't realize they were uploading their location. Uh, we also have point cloud anchors that don't even need any GPS or triangulation at all. They just look at a bunch of pixels on a camera image um, there are bots now on Twitter where you can say, where was this picture taken? And it will throw it into a, a convolutional neural net and it will give you a pretty darn good uh, estimate of where in the world that photo was taken. Um, we have apps now that are broadcasting this for public uh, data purposes. A famous example was Strava a few years ago. Um, and it revealed the location and layout of U.S. military bases around the world, many of them secret. <laughs> previously. <laughs> um, location data is unique to you. Um, it's, it is literally your digital footprint. And if you think about the other types of personally identifying information that are out there that we really take seriously, um, like Equifax breach, we think about like your name, your address, your, um, your, perhaps your passwords, your social security number, your credit cards, your phones. Phone numbers, almost all of these are less unique to you than your location footprint. Um, there's the classic, like, new phone, who's this? Um, yeah, phone numbers cycle, but your history of where you went does not cycle. It is extremely unique to you. So just as a thought experiment, think about last week for a second. Think of three places you went, uh, just at random, like any three places. I'll give you a second. Now, raise your hand if you can think of one other person who is with you at each of those three locations at the same time. We've got a few hands, um, but not, not that many. Um, it's rare for you to, to, to travel at all times with the same person. If you live in a, a house with a, with a spouse, for example, you probably work in different locations, um, even though you share the you know, your, your night, you don't share your day. So that's identifying even with just two location points. Um, so there are, there are a number of attack vectors that exist and exploit this pattern. Um, the most common one that you hear about is called re-identification. This is basically taking a location feed and usually these feeds, if they're published, they're stripped of personal identifiers, the obvious ones anyway, like name. Um, and, uh, oftentimes they are not uh, uh, really altering the GPS or the location coordinates that much. Um, so what you can do is you can actually uh, look up other data sources of geographic data like OpenStreetMap or like uh, other websites like let's say celebritiehomes.com. <laughs> um, and if you look for, for trips that start or end around these locations, um, then you can get a pretty good uh, signal into, into who these people are uh, even though it's just sort of in the soup of, of location data, like these maps show. <clears throat> um, Re-ID is, is interesting for, for a lot of like academic purposes, uh, but there's another method, which is a, like a little tweak on that, that I call Re-ID Plus. Um, Re-ID Plus, uh, I made up this word, there might be a, another word for it in academia, but whatever. Um, it basically means that you're doing a, a re-identification with, with coordinate data 
uh, but you also know something about your target. You're going after a particular individual or a group of individuals and, and using that advantage as, a, as an additional exploit. So examples of this would be like um, knowing where someone works so that you could use that as sort of a, an additional anchor, anchor point that isn't associated with, uh, with their home, which is basically public information. Um, perhaps you are physically with a person. So if I was uh, with Seth, let's say, after this, and I saw him get onto a bike, and I said, and I noticed, noted the time, and I, and I uh, was to look through this feed later, and Seth said, okay, I'm going away, and um, I'm going somewhere secret. <laughs> um, I could look this up later and probably tell exactly where he went. Um, this really kind of breaks the social contract that we all have in our heads about like what people are supposed to know about us and what privacy, what our kind of basic privacy is as we move through the world. Um, <clears throat> there's also uh, targets where we're t looking after a particular type of population that uh, even if you don't get to a name, it's not really a re-identification, it's still extremely dangerous for that population. Um, so common examples of this would be uh, border crossings. Um, obviously there's huge uh, crackdowns really around the world, around borders in Syria, Turkey, uh, the United States, and, and Mexico, where people are moving through very remote locations to, uh, on the slide, cross the border. Um, and authorities are actually scraping up this data and they're using it to target. Um, so if, if there's no road for, for 100 miles around you and you're sending out location coordinates, uh, that's a pretty good signal that they should deploy uh, law enforcement out to that area. So we have to be very careful, even if, even if we're talking about data in a, in a place that isn't linked to anything else when we're talking about these sensitive populations. Another very common one is, is uh, protests. So you could look at uh, a Trump rally and find all the Trumpers. You could find a counter Trump rally, uh, maybe the Women's March, and find all, all the origins of pe where people came from to get there. You could send out political mailers. Uh, this has been used in the past several years in elections um, to suppress votes. Basically, imagine one of those populations, send them out some scary mailer in bulk, and, and you've had a pretty material effect on, on the world. Um, Re-ID is really not necessary for, for malicious use. Um, additionally, a lot, of the, a lot of the academic literature is focused on what we call deterministic re-ID. So this means that I am very certain that... Uh, that the name that I pulled out of the hat is actually the person. But in a lot of cases, this doesn't really matter that much. I mentioned the mailer case, like we could sort of have a rough idea, but how much does it really send to, or how much does it really cost to send a, a political mailer? It's like 10 cents or something in bulk. So if I get like a 10% um, re-ID accuracy rate and 90% of them are false, I don't really care. I could, I could spend a couple thousand dollars, which any political campaign could. Um, and still make a very big difference. Um, deterministic re-ID is very hard. Um, there's uh, places where this kind of data has been used in court cases. It's resulted in wrongful convictions. So I definitely don't want to overstate the, um, the accuracy of, of any of this research. Um, there are places where it's been used in kind of similar patterns of like old school polygraphs, which we know, know don't really hold up to science. Location data is like that in a lot of ways. But if you're a hacker, um, if you're a political operative, you don't really care if it's going to hold up in court. The whole idea is that you probably don't want it to end up in court. <laughs> um, so there's a, a paper that came out. It was published in Nature in 2013. And it's called Unique in the Crowd, The Privacy Bounds of Human Mobility. It found a couple of very interesting findings. One was that it took just four random uh, location points in a mobility data set. They had about a year, a year and a half of mobility data um, from that time. It just took four points to uniquely identify 95% of the population. Um, if you drop this down to just two points, so remember our, our guesstimate earlier was, uh, was with three points and we had maybe I would say about 20% of people raise their hand in the room. Um, so with two points, you can still identify 50% of the population. So if you're, if you're malicious, like I said, it's, it doesn't really matter if it's 50% accurate as long as you can do that profitably. 
or uh, at least not like too expensively. Um, <clears throat> so hacking location data. About six months ago, I noticed a significant uptick in this data being published online. Um, mostly this was from scooters. There's a new specification called MDS, the Mobility Data Specification, written by the city of LA, along with a bunch of other cities now. Um, this is mostly for regulation of scooter data and coordinating with city to share information about where vehicles are moving. It's really important work, um, but, but a trend that we noticed was that essentially this data was often being published out in the clear um, with very little modification often uh, either real-time or close to real-time. Writing about this publicly, um, I revealed that uh, within minutes, I had found a pretty interesting set of trips. Um, this was actually in Austin, Texas. I found a uh, certain high school uh, that had frequently uh, had trips that were going between the high school and a local Planned Parenthood. Um, obviously, this is super sensitive. Uh, Texas is a state that has restrictions on uh, reproductive rights. And if you're a high schooler, it doesn't really matter which state you're in. Like that's obviously like critically sensitive information. Um, it's medical information that has like overlap with HIPAA and, and other types of regulations as well. Um, was it a perfect re-ID? Probably not. Uh, I, this would be a re-ID plus. If you were a school administrator or parent, you probably have access to the logs and you could look at the particular timestamp that that was, that that was built. Um, this data, after contacting the city of Austin, uh, we worked together and they uh, corrected this issue very promptly, um, which I'm really grateful for. Uh, most of the cities, when, when hearing about this kind of thing, uh, immediately take action, uh, which is great. Um, I knew this would be pretty controversial when I posted it, but I didn't quite realize quite how much. Um, when I first started writing about it, I hadn't actually contacted the city yet. Uh, but once this sort of started to stir up, I noticed that I really needed to find some guidelines for ethically doing these disclosures. So I looked to another project that I was familiar with called Google Project Zero. This is their internal kind of security uh, hacking team. They hack other competitors and all sorts of uh, software that's infrastructure that's integral to the web. Uh, and they have a policy where they say, um, we'll give you a private disclosure, we'll give you 90 days to fix it, and at the end of that window, um, you're, it's, it's going to be public, publicized so that uh, the public knows about this vulnerability. You can't sit on it for years and years. Um, so I kind of adapted this to this use case and, and did my best I could to uh, try to make sure that I was doing this as safely as possible. Um, many of the disclosures that I've done have not actually been revealed yet. They either still have the disclosure window or they were fixed in such a way that it just wasn't really necessary. Um, other disclosures kind of didn't fit into this model because there wasn't necessarily a person to contact. And I'll get into an example of that in a second. Um, almost immediately, I began receiving private uh, tips from the community. Um, thank you, some of you here. Um, and basically, the, the, the trend only increased as more and more of these services came online. Um, the sensitive trips, uh, I was able to identify mostly using OSM. Uh, essentially, the way the algorithms that I work, that, that I built uh, work, um, I would sort of start with doing these manually and then write code to, to model it and make it more efficient as I was dealing with more streams. Um, what I would do is I would look at the origin and the destination, so the start and the end of the trip, and look for POIs. Uh, I have a model where I basically rank all the different types of POIs and services in OSM by sensitivity. And I look for places where there is a very sensitive link on one side or the other, but there are not many links. So this is the most vulnerable type of trip. So if you were, let's say, I mean, the Planned Parenthood one is a perfect example. It's a school. So there was some spatial fuzzing that had been applied to that data set, but schools are very large footprint. So the entire fuzz area where they dropped precision was inside the bounds of the school. No one else could have uh, used that data unless they had like broken into the schoolyard and stole a scooter. Um, the other types of things like this are, are hospitals, which are often you know sprawling campuses, uh, cl other types of clinics, which maybe have like a cluster, but there's not very many POIs in that cluster. Um, 
after finding these, I've uh, s securely sent these over to cities and, and we've addressed these issues one by one. I haven't had any cases where a city like saw something like this and uh, like didn't take it very seriously. So that's, that's excellent and it's a real credit to our public servants in the community who, who manage this data. Um, the most serious issues that I've found by far have been uh, what I call like cracks in the foundation. So these are infrastructural level leaks of, of PII, personal information. Um, there's sort of the first level of protocol and then the secondary of the policy level. Protocol would be things like GBFS, and I'll get into the disclosure in a second. Uh, and policy would be like uh, a city who mandates that every single taxi company has to implement MDS or every scooter company has to have a public GBFS feed. That sort of compounds the issues where uh, commercial providers are unable legally to patch fixes in the protocol because they are regulated by by the government and they they have to publish this data. Um, it can get a little complex because sometimes these regulations are competing and contradictory. Um, I found one of these bugs in GBFS. Uh, essentially, I was able to s scrape together. Um, real time or about one minute uh, recency trips with full spatial resolution, so like one to one to five meters spatial resolution. Uh, since posting, I've been able to download uh, roughly a quarter of a billion trips around the world. Um, you can look at this on the GBFS GitHub page, and I highly recommend that you weigh in. Uh, GBFS is a community driven protocol. Um, so it's really important that users and people who understand this kind of stuff uh, make their voice heard and advocate for uh, cleaning up infrastructure like this and help with PRs and review and, and all these kind of things that, that make the world go around safely. Um, just to cycle through some examples here in my last couple minutes, uh, this is a selection of trips in Rockaway, Queens, where you can see origin destinations. Um, here's one in Louisville, Kentucky. You can see this was actually mixed with uh, a docked feed. So it's like a hybrid model, sort of like Minneapolis. Here's one in San Diego, California. You can see longer rides. Some of these might be artifacts from redistribution, but many of them are in the CENI core, and I believe that they are real trips. Here's one in Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills is particularly sensitive because it enables celebrity stalking. Uh, Celebrityhomes.com, I mentioned that. There's other celebrity sites. Um, Jay Leno lives right over there. Elon Musk lives right over there. Uh, you could find all these people. You could look for trips around their house. Their houses tend to be very spread out, so it's particularly vulnerable, and there's obviously a lot of stalkers for these kind of people. It's kind of a, a scary situation there. Here's Seattle. Hollywood, California, obviously another very sensitive one, and probably one of the most sensitive ones here and uh, most saturated is Washington, D.C. Um, we're looking at at the, the mall, you can clearly see, you can see trips between uh, sensitive uh, kind of national security infrastructure, including the White House, FBI buildings, things like that, diplomats, offices, lobbyists. There's a lot of sensitive data probably in this one slide, and this is like 12 hours of trips that happened, I think. Um, yeah, we're talking about like 2 million trips or so roughly globally every day. Fixes. Uh, we need stronger legislation to protect this data on both the government side and the commercial side. Um, anyone handling this data needs to be accountable and responsible for how it's used and, and how they publish it. That's critical. We cannot get by without uh, strong GDPR-like legislation and strong uh, legislation for governments like Cal ECPA in California. These are, these are very critical, and right now, there is practically zero legislation across the United States around this type of data. Uh, we also need to make sure that we follow best practices even before we uh, change the laws. Um, things like data minimization, only collecting what's needed. Uh, encryption, both in REST and when data is in transit between sites. Um, we need robust access controls. So if someone doesn't need it, they shouldn't have it. We shouldn't be sending this data off to contractors or other third parties. Uh, researchers who aren't qualified or don't have the budget to handle this data securely. It sucks that we have to have limits on certain types of data that could be valuable for, for open research. But just like medical records, we could probably save some lives if we published everyone's medical records tomorrow. Uh, but that would not be worth the safety and civil liberties cost. Um, 
at least that's what our current position as society is today. And then lastly, we need to be implementing strong aggregation protocols that uh, obscure individual data. This data, everything that I've showed here today can be published in aggregate form, and it can be published in aggregate form at high resolution as long as we take a couple of precautions. There's a couple of strategies that Google and Apple have forwarded called differential privacy. This uses kind of noise at high levels of granularity and when the data is very sparse and unique. And there's also things called k-anonymization. You essentially aggregate. You can do it at a high spatial and temporal, res temporal resolution. You just drop the stuff that's too unique. So if there's only one trip that ends up in a certain aggregate bucket, delete it. That is, that might as well be an individual trip. Um, that's what I've got. Thank you so much for coming out. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I think I'm out of time. But uh, yeah, feel free to hit me up after or, or uh, if we have time for like one or two, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, not even close. Um, the, the, I, I mean, the Austin, Texas example was three digits of precision. Uh, that gets you to like about 100 meters or so, roughly. Um, but even at like block group, if you're not doing K anonymization where you drop the uniques, I mean, those are, those are unique. So it's really important to not rely just on precision dropping. This is sort of a classic case that gets, I mean, this is the most common uh, factor. And Makes it easy for me. I can use it every time. <laughs> yep. Is there some, some bias in that a lot of the people working on this problem live in cities where there, there is this density? So they might think like three digits is okay, but out in like the middle of the country, there might just not be anything around for a long way. Like that plan here because it might just be the only thing there, right? So it's huge. If you're dealing with this data, um, I like this. I always like to say that you need like a healthy dose of paranoia, but I think you also need a over healthy dose of empathy uh, for the users that are generating this data. This is their data. It's so their movement. From cities, right? Ex exactly. I mean, uh, you know, I live in Oakland, California. Um, I'm pretty happy with my local government, but I'm from the rural. I'm not really rural, but I'm from the South um, where I was a political minority in a certain sense. And uh, it colors your perspective for sure on how you think about this data and how it could be used by people in power and by the political machine. Yep. So, uh, you talked about different fixes, right? But what are uh, practical next steps that we can do maybe in our current field? So, I would highly recommend that um, mo many cities right now are publishing uh, new policies on how they will collect uh, scooter and bike and soon to be taxi data as well. It's already happening to some degree. Um, I would read your local policy, look for the kind of issues that I mentioned. Um, I try to read as many as I can and contact cities when I can, but uh, I can't read them all. Um, so yeah, please do that. If you have um, questions about that, DM me or email me. Um, I'm happy to, to help evaluate those. Um, also, I would say that if you're in a position where you're actually handling this data, um, happy to help like figure out what a good aggregation strategy is. The risk profile can vary uh, depending on the data set, where it is in the world, as we mentioned with like border crossings, things like that. Um, but also sort of like what populations you're dealing with and what the actual vehicle is that's attached to the sensor. Yep. Um, when you talked about you gave, you're, you're like relatively happy with responses from cities, um, what would you say to those responses generally? Uh, so I'll, I'll share... Um, I'll, sh I'll share some that, I mean, I mentioned the Austin one, so that's public now. Um, I basically sent a private email, notified them, sent some screenshots that actually showed like the trip. Uh, they evaluated it, sent me an email back within like a couple hours. Um, the next day they had a patch out that, that uh, actually took down the feed. They replaced it later that week with, a, with one that was privacy protecting using aggregates. Um, that's very standard. Uh, cases at the... Policy level, though, have been much more contentious. I've received 
pretty intense pushback on some of these issues. And um, yeah, I'm a hacker. I'm not a politician. So yeah, I'm less equipped for that. If you do have those skills, that's definitely one way that you could help <laughs> advocating in your local communities for strong privacy protections and, and empathy for the citizens around you. Great. Thank you so much for coming out. I'll be around after and uh, yeah, feel free to hit me up. Thanks. <laughs>